Welcome everyone to this week's Come Follow Me discussion. Um, it's nice to see everyone after uh, a week's break. Um, last week, unfortunately, it seems like everyone's schedules, except for Carl's, uh, proved to be difficult and uh, we weren't able to make it, but thanks to Carl, he was still able to hold down the fort. Announcements from Sunday School, I guess uh, let's all just remember that uh, this week is Sunday School Sunday, first Sunday of the month. So we will be having our Sunday school class on Sunday, and uh, we're lucky enough to have it in person. So this will be the first in-person class uh, for a couple months. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. The plan for Gospel Doctrine is that we will all meet in the sacrament uh, room, uh, and Carl is going to be leading that discussion. Um, the idea there is that uh, in an ideal world, we would we would split up the classes again, but unfortunately, we're kind of restricted with fire codes, and that was kind of our best option. Uh, so we've decided to keep everyone together. Just a quick reminder that that is happening this Sunday. So uh, we'd like to invite everyone to to please come prepared and and ready to discuss. Luckily, it's going to be longer than our short half hour classes on Zoom. So uh, we're we're hoping for some better, more in depth discussions there. Other than that, uh, no major announcements. I guess just a quick reminder that uh, we are still uh, pushing to get this message out to a more of a broad population. And the best way that we can do that is by hitting like or subscribe to uh, either Carl's YouTube channel or Spotify channel. This will be the easiest form of missionary work that you'll that you'll probably ever do. So that's our simple invitation. Uh, with that, I'll turn the time over to Carl. Thank you. Just as a positive result, I'll, I'll say that we had a view this week from Austria. In any case, so today we're going to be covering sections 137 and 138, which is kind of a happy, sad sort of a thing. It means we're coming very quickly here to the end of the Doctrine and Covenants. But it's been a very interesting study so far this year. Of course, we still have a couple of lessons left. So for suggested topics this week, I wanted to show you something that uh, hopefully will tweak teaching in the Lord's way. Then we'll do some follow him favorites. I want to review some of the major Protestant concepts of the 1800s that will help you in your further study of the Doctrine and Covenants. We're going to talk about the salvation problem. Joseph F. Smith will do a little highlight on his life and then recipe for revelation. So the first one is teaching in the Lord's way. I want you to take a look at this scripture in section 137. And this, of course, is Joseph Smith. He's having, having a vision. This occurred just before the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. And in this vision, he sees Adam and Abraham. My first question to you is, how did he know it was Adam and Abraham? Maybe they had name tags. <laughs> <laughs> they were wearing the missionary name tags. I'm going to propose to you that he had already spoken with them individually. And so that uh, he had many visions, obviously. So I'm going to suggest that Adam and Abraham had talked to him one-on-one -on -one before that. In any case, in this vision, he sees Adam and Abraham, his father and his mother, and his brother, Alvin, who is dead. Why is that strange and unusual? I think I read that his father and his mother had not passed away yet. That's correct. They're still alive. Right. So he's having a vision of the celestial kingdom. And the fact that Adam and Abraham are there is, is fine. But his mother, his father, and his brother are there. How can that be? It says right in verse six, he marveled. Well, he was marveling mostly about Alvin. Why was he marveling about Alvin? Well, Alvin passed away before uh, the church was restored. Well, that's right. And he had not been baptized. Yeah. And he had not been baptized. In fact, at okay. his yeah. funeral, the, the presiding minister pretty much said that he'd, he'd had it. There was no hope for him which didn't sit really well with the family. But, so, that was, but that was common belief in those days. If you weren't baptized. Very you, common. You're, you're so what is the Lord? Why did the Lord do this? 
this this particular section is teaching in the Savior's way. So why, what happens here or what's happening here and how could that be a way that the Lord teaches us? Wasn't this pressing on Joseph Smith's uh, mind about his brother and not being baptized and whether he would be able to uh, get into the celestial kingdom? Yeah, he's really... He's the, there's, there are these questions that are all of a sudden happen that Joseph's looking at this and saying, okay, Adam and Abraham, I understand my, my parents, not even dead yet. Alvin who died without back. So the Lord has created the situation in which Joseph is questioning, thinking, Mm -hmm. raising questions about what, what does this mean? Why? Is this happening? And I, I'm going to suggest to you that one way that we can teach more effectively is to raise questions, not that distract you from your faith, but rather cause you to dive deeper. And I think the Lord does that because he only teaches us what we're prepared to understand, line upon line, precept on precept. And so Joseph at this early date, like this particular revelation was given in Kirtland. So the church is very, very new, and he's not prepared for the whole mental dump of here's the entire plan of salvation. This is how it works. But he's causing Joseph to question and to think and to ponder. I, I, re- I really like this point, Carl, because when we teach, we use a lot of questions when we teach. Yes. But, but the real powerful teaching moment is like what you're describing here, when we can get our students to question and to even ask us questions. And that's actually not easy to do, but very powerful when you can do it. Yes, it's very powerful because then they go home and they consider it further and then they research it and they look up and they question and ponder on it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we get into this lesson today. So um, anybody want to share with us some of their favorite scriptures or thoughts or ideas or stories that they heard or read this week? Well, well, I'll start off. I, I really like the end of section 137, verses 7 to 10, because it really outlines in this revelation then, then how those that have not had the opportunity to receive the gospel in this life will still be able to partake of the blessings of the gospel and to, and to even uh, ent- in- enter into the celestial kingdom, including all children who die before they arrive at the years of accountability. So, I mean, this was this was a really ground changing doctrine at that time. But what a wonderful doctrine and also what a wonderful indication of the loving Heavenly Father for all our brothers and sisters, not just the ones, those of us that have been lucky enough to find the gospel in our lives. That is awesome. I enjoyed the scriptures as well. As you can see here, I underlined all in all three verses. Everybody who died without our knowledge will have an opportunity to receive it. Everybody will be judged according to their works and the desires of their hearts. And all children who died before they arrive at the age of accountabilities are saved. Well, of, this, course that, of course, that's all men and women in verse 9. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Equal time, deservedly so. So it's very interesting that in section 137, the Lord solves an age-old problem that we're going to talk about. But he doesn't tell us the how until section 138. Anybody else have uh, something they wanted to share? Um, I I like one of the scriptures in at the end of 138, uh, verse 57. Um, It says, paraphrase the first little bit here. The faithful elders of this dispensation, when they depart from this mortal life, continue their labors in preaching the gospel. And so I remember thinking about that on my mission, kind of like on your mission, or at least maybe this was just for me, but thinking about, you know, life on the other side, once I'm done my mission, I'll kind of get a break. And then reading, kind of coming, coming across this and kind of being reminded that really missionary work never ends. And that in in that context of being on my mission, I was thinking more like after my uh, after my mission, you know, once I get back to normal life, I will still be responsible for 
um, missionary work. But even now, now that I've been home for quite a while and I'm living a regular life, um, just kind of this understanding or nice reminder that missionary work ne- is never going to end. Um, it's not like once this life is over, we are going to get a break from, from the work. Um, and so for me, it just kind of reminds me, uh, you know, along the theme of, of this section that we will continue working hard um, after our lives here on earth so uh, no vacation no break time yeah no vacation no break time uh so it's not like we should ever ease off the gas i guess it's kind of like there's lots of work to be done so much so that we're even expected to do it after this life and anyway i thought that was that was kind of a nice thing that i was able to remember from my mission so so we might as well learn now how to do it well yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And I guess kind of like also maybe let's make sure we're not the ones that need to be preached to. Um, <laughs> <it's not> like <laughs> Let's uh, make sure we're the ones ready to teach. I, one of the podcasts that I was listening to talked about this verse 53. And in the vision in section 138, it says that he sees the prophet Joseph Smith. So 138 is, of course, Joseph F. Smith, which is in 1918, right? And so in this vision, he sees the prophet Joseph Smith, Hiram, his father, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff. And there's somebody conspicuously missing. Who's between Wilfred Woodruff and Joseph F. Smith? I'll give you a hint. He's the tithing guy. Oh, Lorenzo Snow. So where's Lorenzo? So there's Joseph. He goes right down the list. Joseph, Brigham, John, Wilfred. There's no Lorenzo. And so this podcast guy said, well, maybe there is a little tiny vacation after you die and before you get your next calling. I just thought I'd throw that in. I know it's not scriptural, scriptural, and it has nothing to do with it other than what you said about vacation time. I just take whatever vacation I can get. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I want to talk. I want to review a couple of the major uh, Protestant concepts of the 1800, 1800s because it really reflect, reflects strongly on what we're talking about. I think we've talked about this before: Universalism and Calvinism, and the fact that uh, Calvin had a huge impact on the U.S. Protestant concepts in the 1800s and. In Calvinism, only those who are elected by God are saved. God knows who you are. God's got them numbered. And there's nothing you can do about it. You're either saved or you're not. That's Calvinistic. Universalism. Sorry. God created uh, everyone. Yeah, that that presents a problem, which we're going to get into. Then there was universalism, which is what Joseph's father ascribed to, that everybody is saved. Doesn't matter what you do. God loves us. We're his children. He's going to make a way for everybody to be saved. And then there was this Armenianism, which was kind of like mm, in between. God will save those who have faith. So these were the prevalent views at the time of Joseph Smith. And then Joseph comes along and turns everything on its head. Now, I'm going to go a little deeper in here, and I'm going to talk to you about what they call the salvation problem. The salvation problem was this, that there's a deadline, and that's death. And that this is kind of where Lyle was going. God loves everyone. However, salvation only comes from acceptance of Jesus Christ, and most people who lived on the earth never knew Christ. That's the salvation problem. It's not fair. It's not fair. But this idea was only created about 400 years after Christ was on the earth. Paul, in his writings, didn't have a problem with it because he talks about baptism for the dead. Peter, in his writings, didn't have this problem because he talks about Christ visiting the people in spirit prison. In fact, if you look at the art from the early Christian era, what do you notice here, if anything? I really like this one. This is Jesus punching Satan right in the face. It's one of my favorites. 
And then this one here, that's Satan under the door. Oh. That's, you know, Jesus comes in, kicks the door down, and that's Satan underneath there. So what are they depicting here? Uh, liberation of the dead. Yeah, this, this is Christ going to the spirit world. This is Christ um, delivering people from hell and death. The early Christians didn't seem to have this salvation problem either. It was mostly contrived several hundreds of years afterwards, and it had a lot to do with the Greek philosophy that was still permeating that time period. And then we have a, a quote from Joseph Smith. He, meaning God, knows the situation of both the living and the dead and has made ample provision for their redemption. So we can see that even though in the very early days, the members of the church didn't have a complete understanding of the plan of salvation, Joseph certainly did. And I think sometimes Joseph was a little bit reluctant to tell the people everything that he knew. Why do you think that is? Well, he's getting a lot of flack for things. Yeah, I, there's a quote, and I can't remember it exactly, and I should probably have looked it up before the lesson, but it comes to me that Joseph once said to a group of people that I have so much more to tell you, but every time I reveal something new, the saints all fly to pieces. You know, they're just not ready for it. Okay, so let's move on to uh, Joseph F. Smith. I want to talk about him for a moment. I don't think a lot of people know very much about Joseph F. Smith. He's, of course, the son of Hiram. And he's responsible for section 138. He was giving, given a name and a blessing in Liberty Jail. Hiram had never seen his son. Mary brought his son to him when he was in Liberty Jail. And there Hiram gave him a name and a blessing. At age five, of course, his father and his uncle were killed in Carthage. And then at age seven, I know a lot of people talk about at age nine, he drove the wagon to Utah. But at age seven, which was, I think, a harder drive, he drove a team of oxen to winter quarters. And remember what we talked about on uh, our last week lesson, that they came during the rainy season and they basically took them longer to go that 300 miles through the mud and the rain from Nauvoo to winter quarters than it took them from winter quarters all the way to Utah. So that was a very, very difficult. So at age seven, he's driving a team of oxen through the mud. At age 13, his mother dies. At age 15, he's sent on a mission to Hawaii. And I did some interesting uh, research into that. And there are several cases, though there's a little bit of fuzziness here. He was apparently, he had a, a very explosive temper. And I guess you can understand why, because look at the death. Look at the things that had happened to him in his lifetime. He was an angry teenager. We don't have any of those today, do we? Angry teenagers. Anyway, the solution was they sent him on a mission at age 15. And one of the incidents that is recorded was that he assaulted his teacher or, or maybe the principal, they're not sure, for un, unfairly punishing one of the students, which we think may have been his younger sister. He actually decked him. And so they pulled him out of school. He had anger issues. And the presiding brethren decided to send him on a mission, age 15. At age 22, he sent on his second mission. So he goes on that mission for three years to Hawaii. He comes home. And then at age 22, he sent on another mission uh, with the leading brethren of the church to Great Britain. Then when he returns from his mission, he's married and divorced his first wife. Now, that's another very interesting uh, story. They were married for seven years, had no children. Most of the time that they were married, he was away on missions. Then at age 28, he's ordained an apostle. At age 69, he becomes the sixth president of the church. His wife and 13 children died before him. So he's very, very well acquainted with death. 
He served seven terms in the Utah House of Representatives. In 1891, he receives a presidential pardon. Why would he need a presidential pardon? He, didn't he have multiple wives? And so they were persecuting the brethren for that. Five wives. So then he, he needed a presidential pardon for, for plural wives. Then he lived through most of World War I. He died actually in the same month that the war ended, in which there were 40 million deaths worldwide. And then in 1918 was the beginning of the pandemic, which saw 50 million deaths, which was the Spanish flu. And that's kind of the background for section 138, which we're going to go into a little bit more in a minute. But if you think of the Spanish flu for a moment, I don't want to disrespect the people who have passed away because of COVID-19. But COVID-19 is responsible now for 5 million deaths worldwide. The Spanish flu, the conservative um, estimates for the Spanish flu are 50 million. That's a factor of 10. But it doesn't really take into it the full concept, which I'll now explain to you, because the population of the world at that time was one quarter of what it is today. So the equivalent of the Spanish flu today would be 200 million deaths. And compare that to 5 million that's been ravaging us, ravaging us currently. But 200 million obviously is a much larger number. So Joseph Smith, Joseph F. Smith was very, very well acquainted with that. In fact, many of the people who died during the war would have only known Joseph F. Smith as the prophet. He, would, he was the prophet for 20 years. And so all those young men who went off to war and died would have only known him as the prophet. So then he receives this revelation section 138, and then he dies six weeks later. So does that kind of put things more a little bit in perspective? I, I want to talk about this revelation, and I want to use it as an example for receiving revelation. So let's dissect section 138 just a little bit. So what do we learn from section, from verse 1? He was pondering over the scriptures. He's pondering over the scriptures. In particular, what's he thinking about in verse 2? Atoning sacrifice. He's, he's thinking about the atonement of Jesus Christ and what that means. And then in verse 3? Of the return of um, Jesus Christ. Yep. Yeah. He's, he's thinking about this great love that it would have been for not only Christ, but for the Father to give him up, and then the return of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So if we look at that, these are the first three steps of a recipe for revelation, I'm going to suggest to us, that we ponder over the scriptures, that we reflect on the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and consider the love that Heavenly Father had for us in sending his beloved Son to redeem us. I wonder how often we do that, or is that just occurring, you know, once a week during sacrament meeting? I, I don't know that we spend that much time in reflection and pondering. Now, I'm going to go a little bit further. In verse 5, what happens? What's his mind engaged in? The crucifixion of the Lord? Or... In verse 5? Yep. Yeah. He talks about... Um, well, he's, his mind is engaged in what was written by Peter uh, to the saints where the gospel was preached by the Savior. That's uh, 1 Peter 3, where he goes and organized people to preach to those who are in spirit prison. But his mind is still reflecting on the writings. He knows the writings so well. What comes to his mind when he's engaged in this contemplation, this pondering, are the scriptures in Peter, in 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 4. And then the most interesting thing ever happens in verse 6. The first four words. He hasn't even opened his scriptures yet. 
In verse six, now he opens his scriptures. So all of this thinking, this pondering, this engaging of his mind and spiritual thoughts has occurred even before he's opened the scriptures. Now in verse six, I open the scriptures and then he refreshes what he was thinking about Peter. He reads third and fourth chapters of first Peter, and he's greatly impressed with these scriptures. And then he actually goes on to quote them. And so I think that one of the recipes for revelation, which today perhaps we're missing is this pondering over scriptures. And again, he knew the scriptures so well, he didn't even have to open them in order to ponder on them. This reflection of what the Lord has done for us in his atonement, the love of our heavenly father, and then his reverting to the scriptures and immersing himself in the scriptures. Now I'm going to show you a picture that I found that I would like you to comment on. Are you ready? Where to get the cell phone? It's an interesting rendition. <laughs> but what's the painter trying to tell us? We can get distracted very easily from our mm -hmm. scriptures through social media, whatever our distract distraction may be. It is very, very easy, I think, to get distracted from or by modern technology. On the other hand, modern technology offers us so much more information. But is the additional information, I'm not going to say worth it, because I think it is worth it, but mm -hmm. is the potential for distraction overcoming our desire to understand and know the will of the Lord? We have to learn to use it properly. Yes. As with all things that are good and wonderful that are introduced to the world, the Lord introduces something to help us. And then Satan introduces a twist on it to ensnare us or to divert our attention away. Deception, distraction, and discouragement. Yeah, those are all tools of the devil. Now, I want to show you another picture. And I want you to compare this painting with this picture. Are you ready? Does anybody know what this is? The Celestial Room. It's the Celestial Room in Washington, D.C., which is considered, well, all celestial rooms would be considered one of the most holy places on Earth. What do you notice about this location? about this picture. There's, there's no artwork in this last room. Okay. Why? I find, I have found that when you're in the celestial room, your eyes are always drawn heavenward. Um, you're always, well, I tend to look up and, and ponder. Oh, I was just commenting on Sue's comment. There's a lot of leading lines that are pointing up, right? That's, I yeah. agree with you. I noticed that as well. And, um, and the light is coming from above. Mm -hmm. One thing I've always noticed is that they never have windows, windows that you can see outside or be distracted by things outside. So there's no distraction. And there's simplicity in the room. Mirrors, clean. light, mirrors, beauty. It's always very clean, yeah. free from clutter. And if you were there, it would be silent or near silent, very reverent. Round, round room, no corners to hide in. <laughs> and how different that is from the world that we live in. I, I'm going to propose to you that there is so much distraction in the world today. There's so much going on that we fail in many instances to stand still, to ponder, to reflect, to consider, and to prepare ourselves to receive revelation because and, we're so busy. 
it's it's also it's it's also not necessarily about distraction, but one of the reasons why I said there's no artwork in there, whereas there's lots of artwork and lots of it in all the other places in the temple. But artwork is it's like an interpretation by someone else. So it's it's also like studying the scriptures by listening to other people's presentation about it, uh, like the podcasts that are out there so numerously. So I mean, learning the scriptures by listening to other people interpret them is very different than trying to understand the scriptures through personal revelation from Heavenly Father. And and I think it kind of represents that as well here too. I mean, this is this is where we need to gain our own revealed understandings and but not Ron, rely on other people. It's so much it's so much easier yes, to, to listen is. to other people and to get that knowledge. Yeah. And documentary books have been around for decades through on the scriptures. I'm are are you suggesting that it would be better for me to actually read my own scriptures and struggle through it, even though I don't have an, a degree in ancient languages or philosophy, and that I have to just struggle there myself? Well, I'm, I'm suggesting that's the ultimate what we should be striving for, yes. There's not, I mean, there's nothing wrong with coming to Sunday school class and listening to our teachers and discussing and sharing, but ultimately we need to seek our own, uh, our own understanding through personal revelation. Well, I, it was a very interesting study for me this week. I would like to testify to you, to all those who are listening, that this struggle that we have to go through to receive revelation is so important. The Lord is trying to teach us but oftentimes we get so embroiled in other things, we don't sit still long enough to listen, to ponder and reflect. And that's one of the major reasons why we're here. There are a number of very important reasons why we're here on earth. But one of the important ones is to learn to receive revelation. And that can't happen unless you invite a situation in which the Lord can speak to you. I mean, if it's a really dangerous situation, he's going to speak to you at any time. But if you're trying to receive revelation, I would suggest that we need to slow down a little bit, find some time, somewhere during the day where we can have peace and quiet and where the Lord can speak to us as we contemplate and reflect upon the things that he wants us to know. And so that's kind of what I learned yet again for the, I don't know how many times this week. I was going to say the temple is a great place to do that. It is, but it doesn't have to be just in the celestial room. It can be anywhere. It can be in your closet at five o'clock in the morning, at two o'clock in the afternoon, at 10 o'clock at night, or whenever it is that you find time to commune with the Lord, to pray and to read. And this idea of finding time to read the scriptures and not just say the words, but ponder and reflect on them like Joseph F. Smith did, like Joseph did, where they went deeper than just reading the words is so critical. It's so important, especially as we move forward and we get into more and more difficult times where we need to understand and know what the Lord would have us do. And having said that, I will turn it back over to Jesse. Hey, Carl, just to add some commentary to your last points there, I think that like, obviously like this rings or it hits home for me. Uh, I'm at a very busy point in my life. You know, I've got a lot of young kids and I've got a difficult career choice that I've taken uh, that's very busy and I don't have a lot of free time anymore. And I know that a lot of people go through this, uh, these moments in their lives as well. But, um, and so I'll be honest, I, I struggle with this, like setting that time aside to actually listen or to just be calm or to be still or to, you know, um, take some things off my plate so that I'm not always so busy. Um, but I know that it doesn't have to be what I've seen. And when I have been better at it or good at it, um, it doesn't require a lot of time always, but what it requires is more consistency um, throughout like the week. So a little bit of time, but more often. 
or the idea of removing some of those distractions throughout the day, whether that be, I know for me, I found um, not listening to music or anything while I'm driving, anytime I drive. Um, in the in the past, I've found that I've, you know, I've enjoyed music or podcasts just as a way to kind of let my mind wander after a long day at work or something like that. Um, but sometimes it's better to just sit in silence and actually think. Um, so anyway, my, my main kind of point of that comment is that uh, everyone, although everyone is busy, it's, it's always possible to find those little moments. Um, and I, I really do believe that as we, as we try, um, I do know that, that God understands our situations and is, is very forgiving of, of our weaknesses and, and will understand and, and help us. Uh, during our busy times, if we if we make that little effort to to give him a little bit more time, so um, uh, it's not easy, but it is possible. Anyway, with that in mind, I don't know if anyone's got any other comments. Uh, otherwise, I can uh, I'll close the meeting with a word of prayer.